Earlier this year, I watched the final battle between Naruto and Sasuke from Naruto Shippuden. I'd long ago fallen off the ninja bandwagon and have barely touched the series in over a decade. But seeing as it came to an end this year, I became curious as to what the final encounter looks like in animated form. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but what I saw surprised me. Namely, because it was genuinely pretty great. The animation was beautiful, the colour design was solid, and the editing was on point. And watching the fight flow from ninja battle to giant monster fight to just two old former allies beating the shit out of each other, it was oddly nostalgic, and I'm not saying it's the greatest fight in anime, I don't even think it's the greatest fight in Naruto. But this final showdown between the two childhood friends did hit me on an emotional level I was not expecting and succeeded in closing out Naruto's story in a way I just didn't get from the manga. This is not a ringing endorsement for Naruto or for its 654 episodes, but it did make me curious to dive back into the world of Ninja and explore its place within the industry, as well as its decrease in popularity over time. I've had a lot of people request I do a Fall of Naruto video in the same vein I did my Fall of Bleach video. While I'm sure a video like that would traffic well, when you look at the two series side by side, the comparison just isn't there. For starters, if we take a look at the Shonen Jump ranking data, specifically what we're talking about in the Fall of Bleach video is this section right here, this meteoric drop in popularity. And in comparison, Naruto didn't really suffer a fall as much as it did a gentle decline. Sales of Naruto never dipped below the millions per year during its publication, and even vastly outsold its rival One Piece in foreign sales. And perhaps most importantly, author Masahi Kishimoto has gone on record saying that he was able to end the manga on his terms the way he wanted, which is a far better fate than what happened to Bleach. But that said, I still think there's a story here. After all, Naruto has, in its 14 years, become a juggernaut of merchandise and sales. Kishimoto's net worth is estimated at a staggering $20 million, and the series has become so synonymous with anime and manga that it's regularly referenced in other media. And its total global lifetime sales surpass X-Men, Captain America, and even Dragon Ball Z. Even anecdotally, for years you couldn't go to any con around the world without seeing numerous Leaf Village headbands or Akatsuki cloaks. Make no mistake, Naruto is a full-blown global phenomenon. But all this said, it's hard to ignore the fact that it has lost some of its momentum over its 14-year run. While many miles above Bleach in terms of raw success, it's also a far cry from its rival One Piece. While Naruto is indeed more successful in foreign sales, there's over a hundred million sales separating the two globally, and much of its popularity has eroded in the West, losing out to more modern titles like Attack on Titan, Tokyo Ghoul, and Haikyuu, all of which outsold Naruto in 2015, even though the Tankabons were still being released. So, I have three questions. What made Naruto so popular in the first place? What explains its gradual erosion of popularity? And finally, what is it that kept it suffering the same fate as Bleach? Well friends, we are going to answer all those questions. So sit back, relax, and let's talk about The End of Naruto, a series of highs and lows. Naruto began publication in 1999 in Shonen Jump magazine, and when you look at the top three Jump series of that time, one distinction that Naruto has is that it was intensely focused on its characters as opposed to its plot. Yu-Gi-Oh! was about card games, One Piece was about adventuring, and Akira no Go was about, well, Go. The series was less focused on the idea of being a ninja as much as it was on what being a ninja meant to its different characters. And for our main character, Naruto Uzumaki, it was a way for him to prove himself to a society that both feared and despised him, namely because he was possessed by the dangerous nine-tailed fox demon. And this was a powerful message to send to young Shonen Jump readers, that you may not yet fit into society, but through hard work and mastering your own potential, anything is possible. A lot's been said about Naruto and his rival, and also secondary main character, Sasuke Uchiha. And while I have to say I'm not particularly fond of either character, they do both at least have defined personalities and core driving motivations. 
Where the two characters really start to work though is how they play off one another. And watching the two young ninja try and better each other makes for some of the most entertaining parts of the entire series. In fact, the first time Naruto achieved the number one spot in the Shonen Jump weekly rankings was the memorable chapter when the two compete to leave the highest mark on a tree, making it one of the only manga that year to topple one piece from its throne. Outside the main cast is where you'll find one of Naruto's greatest strengths, its cavalcade of likeable and supporting secondary characters, many of whom are arguably more interesting than the three main characters, coming with their own unique abilities, fighting styles and backstories. No matter who you are or what kind of character you like, you are going to find at least one character here you can relate to, whether it's the gentle but awesome Hinata, the laid back but infinitely cool Kakashi, or the talentless fuck up who I will love to the rest of my days, Rock Lee. One thing that really helped this was the distinct and memorable design of each character. They all came with a bold and expressive colour palettes, everything from Naruto's bright orange jumpsuit to Gara's striking shock of red hair. Each character cut a unique and stylish silhouette, enhanced by some great and memorable outfits that were packed with all these little character details. It feels like a lot of work went into making each individual design feel distinct and expressive. I mean, even look at all the different ways Kishimoto found for each ninja to wear their iconic headband. It's really pretty clever. All this came together to give the series a great look and led to some of the most charmingly memorable Tankabon covers in the industry, as well as greatly enhancing the visual aesthetic of the TV show. Speaking of the TV show, when the anime of Naruto wants to, it looks really, really good. And not just like TV good, but like holy shit, look at this animation good. And this really helps sell a lot of the more intense encounters. Granted, this animation only kicks in for a small percentage of the show, but when it does, it's absolutely beautiful. The most prominent place you'll find these great animations is in the intensely imaginative and often pretty violent fight scenes. The combat was never really a case of who's stronger, but more who's smarter, who's more creative, and who's better prepared. They were also on a far smaller scale than that of your average shonen series. Attacks tended to be clever and focused as opposed to the usual excessive displays of force. And this gave the fights a certain intimacy not found in other shows. One of Kishimoto's major strengths is working the emotions and narratives of the characters into his fights. There's a lot of great fights I could point to here, but the highlight for me has always been Rock Lee vs. Gara from the Chunin selection exam. I think the true beauty of this fight is how it's a clash of each respective character's ideology. Like take Rock Lee, born without any aptitude for using ninja magic, weapons or illusion techniques, has poured his heart and soul into mastering Tai Jutsu, simple hand to hand combat. He's essentially the poster boy for the phrase hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Then you have Gara the cold, callous, natural genius, and possessor of the evil tanuki spirit that allows him to effortlessly control massive quantities of sand. Watching Lee struggle not only against Gara but his own limitations is damn near inspirational, and elevates the fight so far above your average shonen slugfest, instead becoming a desperate battle of spirit versus natural talent. If you don't lose your mind when Lee drops the weights, then I don't know what to tell you, I'm not sure we can be friends. So with so much going for it, where did Naruto start to go downhill? What caused it to start losing popularity? I think the best way to answer that question is to break it into two parts, the manga and the anime. And seeing as it all started with the manga, what say we begin there? But first, I'd just like to address an idea that seems to crop up in the anime manga community every few months. And that is that the main reason a series declines is because an author gets lazy. To remedy this, I want you to join me for a little thought experiment. You are a young, talented manga author pitching to Shonen Jump for the first time. You spend weeks on your first chapter, drafting and redrafting, making every panel sing and each line of dialogue sharp and punchy, until finally, you take it to the higher-ups of Jump and they give you a ton of notes and revisions. You spend weeks more honing your manga to perfection until finally it's accepted and you are a published author in Shonen Jump. Congratulations! All the pain and suffering was worth it. But now, rather than having weeks to craft a new chapter, you have a mere seven days, a tiny fraction of what it took to make chapter one. And the same for the deadline after that, and the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that, until you either get sick, cancelled, or die. 
After months of this, you are physically and creatively exhausted. Your drawing quality goes down and you're using all the tropes of storytelling that you always railed against. And you watch as your precious manga becomes filled with long lost ancestors, filler arcs and ass pull plot solutions. Just to give you enough time to stay ahead of the deadlines. And imagine doing this all while enduring the 24-7 death march of drawing, writing and inking. In other words, being a manga author is hard. Really, really, really hard. One Piece's Oda recently put out a job advertisement for an assistant, and it stated that the applicant needs to be ready to, and I quote, die for One Piece. And even Kishimoto himself. He got married in 2003, but took his honeymoon 11 years later in 2014, after Naruto had concluded. This is the life of the weekly Shonen Jump manga author. This punishing existence affects each mangaka in different ways. But generally, whatever your weakness is as a manga author, it will be brought to the forefront. For Kubo, it was his character writing. And for Kishimoto, it's his draftsmanship. I would never suggest that Kishimoto is bad at drawing. That's just objectively untrue. But out of the original big three, I would consider him artistically the weakest. Even at his best, his drawings don't have the effortless natural quality and finesse of Bleach, nor do they have the eccentric energy and punch of One Piece, and this would only become more prevalent over time. Here is an early page from Naruto, and while I don't necessarily think it's quite up there with Kubo or Oda, you can't deny the energy and enthusiasm of each page. And here is some pages from later on in Naruto Shippuden. And while they're certainly functional and convey their message, there's a significant drop in the gesture, energy, and detail of each character. And after doing a little research, I think there's three distinct factors that led to this. For one, while Kishimoto drew a lot as a child, unlike Kubo or Oda, who seem to be drawing their entire lives, there's an old interview where Kishimoto talks about how he fell away from drawing for a period of time in order to pursue sports like baseball and basketball. And it was actually only upon viewing the cinematic poster for the film Akira that he became re-inspired and started drawing again. And I think this period of inactivity in his life goes some way to explain the gap between his abilities and those of his rivals. This ever so slight weakness in draftsmanship would eventually lead to him needing to redesign a lot of the characters in order to make them easier to draw. And the first time he did this was in the first draft of the first chapter opting to change Naruto's goggles to the now iconic headband. While that particular detail became plot significant and actually worked out for the better, a lot of the redesigns that came later on in Shippuden really played down the expressiveness that made the originals so great, especially much later on when a lot of the ninjas started wearing the standard ninja SWAT uniform, completely losing any semblance of originality in their design. Oh, and fun facts, most of these redesigns were inspired by the aesthetic of the first Matrix movie. Make of that what you will. Lastly, and I have to preface this and say that this is pure speculation on my part, but I get the feeling that towards the end of Shippuden, Kishimoto was probably penciling far less of the manga than we might think. And I say this after reading the sequel manga to Naruto, Boruto which is drawn entirely by Kishimoto's lead assistant, Mikio Ikimoto. This is a page from early Naruto. This is a page from later on in Shippuden. And this is a page from Boruto. And to me, it looks like there's a lot more visual similarities between these two than there are between these two. Backing this up further, when asked in an interview to please continue drawing the manga, Kishimoto replied that he was not physically able. And so if the creation of the manga had taken its toll on him to the point that it was affecting his health, which is very, very, very common among mangaka, it would make sense that he would rely on his assistance more and more for later parts of the series. Again, this is not laziness as much as it is an industry refusing to acknowledge the limitations of the human body. The 14 year grind would also take its toll on Naruto's story. I actually really enjoy the first 134 odd episodes of Naruto. Sure, there's parts that drag on longer than they should, but all the arcs feel distinct and memorable and there's some great encounters in there. The problem would come later on in Naruto Shippuden, as the focus of the story shifted from a group of children learning to be ninja 
to a group of teenagers simply being ninja. A lot of the themes of the series like growing up, working hard and mastering your own potential fell away in favour of bloodline techniques, cumbersome and overly convoluted lore and an ever ballooning cast of uninteresting characters. Post time skip was also more focused on Naruto and Sasuke individually and again I think these characters work best together but when they're by themselves they are far less interesting. Power level escalation became a problem with the series too. As Naruto and Sasuke progress in strength, it pushes a lot of the supporting cast further into the background as they simply cannot keep up with the level of the main characters and therefore lose the ability to have significance in the overall story, the piccolo effect as I like to call it, with characters like Rock Lee and Sakura tragically left in the dust. And this really sucks because a lot of the charm of early on in the series was watching each individual ninja's unique approach to combat. And as the series went on, it's like they got further away from this style, with later encounters feeling closer to giant clumsy mecha battles than anything resembling these small scale more intimate ninja fights that were initially so compelling. Naruto's character arc also presents some issues in the long run, mainly that from chapter 1 his core driving motivation is to be acknowledged by the village of Konoha, and he achieves this after defeating Pain in chapter 449. The only major story point left is for the confrontation between Naruto and Sasuke, and seeing as Sasuke had already fulfilled his core motivation by killing Itachi, the logical narrative conclusion at this point would be to have the two face off and bring the series to an end. However, by now, Naruto was already a full-blown worldwide phenomena, so in the eyes of the Shonen Jump management, ending it was not an option. This led to the tiresome and bloated Ninja War arc, which rather than being based on the characters was far more based on the cumbersome and slightly uninteresting lore of Naruto's world. While it does have some really amazing moments, neither Kaguya or Madara are that interesting as villains. And this is a big problem, because if the 40 or so people I interviewed for this video are anything to go by, this turned a massive portion of the fanbase off the series. Which is a real problem, because when you look at that arc overall, it spans over a third of the entire manga. The anime came with its own set of problems. I've already mentioned that when the anime kicks it into high gear, it looks incredible, but the problem is that this really only accounts for about 5-10% to of the show overall. The issue with Naruto is that the animation can be very, very sparse at times, and when you combine this with Naruto Shippuden's much simpler redesigns, it can make for some pretty flat and bland feeling shots. The other major issue with the anime is it's chock full of filler. Filler, in case you're unaware, is material added into the anime that is not part of the original manga. And it's done because a single chapter of manga is generally not enough material to fit into a 22 minute animated episode. And seeing as both are on a weekly schedule, even if the manga starts far ahead of the anime, it's inevitable that the anime will catch up and thus a studio is faced with either going on hiatus and potentially losing a lot of its staff or adding in filler new material from a different writer to give the manga a chance to get ahead. Filler tends to be pretty low quality, as whoever does write it has their hands tied by the fact that they can't kill anyone, can't make any meaningful changes to the characters of the world, and must conform to what I'm guessing are some pretty stringent narrative guidelines, seeing that everything has to end up just the way it started as not to mess with the continuity whenever the story kicks back into canon. And it is actually incredible how much of the total of Naruto's anime is filler. This bar represents the 654 currently aired episodes of Naruto and Naruto Shippuden, and these red sections represent every part of the series that's filler. That's a massive 42% of the entire show, a staggering 254 episodes. That means if you were to watch all of Naruto in its entirety, you would consume approximately 104 hours of what is essentially high budget, highly regulated Naruto fan fiction, and not even the kind people like. I mean, God, you could watch all of Hunter x Hunter one and a half times in the time it would take you just to watch the filler of Naruto. 
think about that and go watch Hunter x Hunter, some guy did a video on it. I think when you take all this into account, it's easy to see why Naruto had its steady drop in popularity. However, despite all this, the series never dropped lower than number three in the yearly rankings. And on top of that, Naruto was still very much a Shonen Jump figurehead, regularly occupying its cover up to and beyond its conclusion, and still a huge part of its crossover merchandise. So, what was it that kept Naruto from suffering the same fate as Bleach? Well, if I was to think about the two series as a whole, my answer would be that it's because Naruto and Sasuke grew up. What I mean by this is that as slow as the story of Naruto could progress, it was always progressing. Things changed, alliances formed and split, characters got older, died and fell in love there were monumental shifts in the landscape of Naruto's world, and each character was affected by them. So I think the reason Naruto was able to retain a large portion of its audience is that the story never really stopped, it just slowed down. If you look at Bleach's overarching story, at the end of each arc, the universe basically resets and everything goes back to the way it was, only to have some brand new, wholly unrelated threat come up in its place. Whereas with Naruto, you can follow a logical, if not elegant, through line from chapter 1 all the way through to chapter 700. And I think this is why those final few episodes had the effect on me they did. Whatever you may think of Naruto overall, when you watch that final encounter, you get this very real sense that it's been a monumental journey that's brought these two characters to this point. And the thing is, it really has. 14 years, in fact. I was a teenager when I first read Naruto, and so many things have changed in my life since then, and it's really nostalgic seeing the same thing reflected in two characters that I at one time really cared about. Because there was a time in my life when Naruto was my favourite series, and this last, final encounter reminded me of why that was, and I can't really give it any higher praise than that. Do I recommend you go back and watch or read all of Naruto? No. Absolutely not. It's too big, it's too long, and it's too much of a commitment. But that said, if you had or have any fondness in your life for the series, then I encourage you to go back and watch those final few episodes. Trust me, you'll be glad you did. Friends, this draws to a close another video. A huge shout out to my good buddy Rebecca who once again did the fantastic illustrations for this episode. I highly, highly recommend checking out her Tumblr. It's really, really great. I want to thank you for joining me today, and I really want to thank everyone on Twitter who shared with me their thoughts and feelings on the series overall. And if you'd potentially like to be interviewed for future videos like this, then come find me on Twitter at iPatchWolf. I will of course be back soon with another video, but in the meantime, why not come join me on the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast, as we break apart Final Fantasy XV, The Last of Us Part II, and Makoto Shinkai's latest film, Your Name. Friends, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.